the Triathlon Show 381. Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to another episode of that Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode we have the third Q&A of the year and this one is on the topic of bike training in a triathlon context. I have scientific triathlon coach Lachlan Kirin as co-host. Lachlan has been on the podcast before so he needs no long introduction but just briefly he's been a scientific triathlon coach for coming up on four years and uh, he also used to race on the pro long course circuit for many years and uh, currently he's undertaking a PhD alongside of his coaching. But before we get into the Q&A, big thanks to our sponsors, Form. The Form Smart Swim Goggles give you real-time feedback in your swim training through a display on the goggle lens. You can see every split as well as average pace for the interval. And alongside that, you can see stroke rate and even heart rate through integration with polar heart rate monitors. All of this helps you execute your swim workouts better, and it also makes them more fun and engaging. In the Form app, you can also get access to in-depth post-swim analysis, and your workouts will seamlessly sync to platforms like Training Peaks, Strava, Today's Plan, and Final Search. The app also has a library of workouts and training plans to pick from, or you can build your own guided workouts. Get 15% off the goggles with the code TTS15 on formswim.com forward slash TTS. And thank you to Zenate. The Zenate Indoor Swim Trainer is a unique trial and swim trainer that allows you to improve your technique, power, and swim training consistency. It is a perfect tool to complement your pool and open water swimming, as it allows you to do very specific power and technique work, including working your catch and your core activation, and it makes it easier to stay consistent even when you can't go to the pool. You can try the Senate risk-free for up to 30 days, so if you don't love it, just send it back. And you can get a special TTS bundle, including the swim bench and a bunch of Senate training plans and on-demand workouts on senatesoonturn.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, let's get into this Q&A on bike training. All right, welcome back to the show, Lucky. How are you doing? Good, thank you, Michael. It's good to be back always. Uh, so let's get started with some bike questions that the listeners have sent in. We have quite a lot, so so I guess we'll try to be uh, relatively brief and uh, but still uh, give some uh, enough details so, so that the answers are useful. And uh, uh, yeah, let's just start with the first one, uh, which is from McConnell, uh, who writes. I recently got my first TT bike and my power is around 10% lower than my road bike. Is this normal? And if so, how long before this gap closes? I have got a bike fit already. Um, yeah, I mean, personally, from my, my experience, I'd say that's quite a normal and, and 10% um, certainly seems in the in the realm of what, you know, I'd expect to be normal for, for a couple of reasons. I guess one is you're using slightly different muscle groups or firing patterns and also just closing off the hip angle a bit uh, most likely i mean obviously he said that he's already had a fit but um there's a lot of factors as well whether it's crank length uh drop from the handlebars to the to the pads um you know so it is kind of a completely foreign position if it's your first tt bike um and also again you know even if you've had clip on tt bars on the road bike uh it's going to most likely be quite a lot more forward using kind of quadriceps a little bit more maybe and, and less glutes but yeah there, there's a lot of factors there what do you think um yeah i think that i would say per percentage works well to a point but at a certain point maybe it works better to just talk about watts so if if we're talking yeah. about uh like a world tour rider with a 400 uh what ftp then uh, i would probably talk about watts rather than percent or i think it the percentage basically breaks down because it's not the same depending on what level of rider we're talking about but yeah if it's somebody with uh an ftp of let's say um 200 280 watts or or below then 10 percent could be quite normal although I, I think that you can up getting up to five percent is something that should be achievable for for most athletes and uh yeah that that's that, that would be my goal but i think 10 percent is absolutely normal so so if yeah answering the question of if it's normal yes it is um uh, but i think that the objective could be to try to get it to more like five percent or or if we talk watts maybe get it to 15 watts below or 10 watts below even your yeah uh, i think i think back. i think i'm with you there that yeah 10 percent is kind of 
acceptable to begin with, but it shouldn't just be a given. Like we, we don't have to just accept it forever. Um, certainly we can expect that to come up with more time in position and potentially making some, some small changes along the way, whether that's yeah shorter crank length and or higher at the front, things like that. Um, I know personally for me, by the time I, I kind of got to the end, I, I was almost higher power on my TT bike than road bike. But, but again, I was just spending so much more time in that position. Yeah. So on the question, uh, the second part of the question, how long before this gap closes, um, I would say that two to three months of really focused work on the TT bike will already uh, probably give you some cl- close some of it, but then it can keep closing, basically get closer and closer over years, really, as you uh, said there in your example. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Right. So next question is from Jan, who writes, when performing interval training in zone four or zone five on the bike, I find it easier to perform the high intensity intervals uphill instead of on a flat course to reach higher intensities. Do you achieve the same or a different training impact uh, on uphills versus flats? And if it's different, when would you recommend riding uphill and when not? I think it really depends on what the purpose is. Um, if we're talking about trying to get central stress, then I'm not sure the heart and lungs necessarily mind if you're on the flats or going uphill or going downhill or if it's windy. Um, you know, that, that the stimulus there is probably quite similar. But in saying that, you know, when we're talking about it from a, the context of triathlon, I'm a very big believer in being able to actually push power at, uh, you know, with high kinetic energy. So, so why are you actually going fast? Um, I think this is something that the advent of indoor training and Zwift, um, you know, obviously has a multitude of benefits, but I've certainly seen with athletes that it can kind of hamper that ability to actually push power while they're going fast. Um, so, you know, in this example, I assume we're talking a five or six zone model. So potentially if, if we're talking that zone five or zone six even, then maybe it's not that important to, to go fast. But I think if we're talking zone four or, you know, quote unquote threshold, then then potentially there is kind of some benefit to be had in doing them on the flats and actually going fast while you're doing it within the realm of what's safe. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with, with that. And uh yeah, de- definitely on the central uh, cardiovascular adaptations, I, I think that it doesn't matter. And that's why when I would give zone five intervals, VO2 max intervals, I tend to tell athletes to do them upright and on, on the road bike if they want to, because uh, that's how most athletes produce more power. So, and uphill, certainly if they are uh, doing them outdoors. But yeah, zone four, I think is, like you say, there are definitely big advantages of being able to do that going uh going at a high speed so but I, I think there may be it depends on the time of season as well or the time of the year so so if you're racing in the summer and and it's february then yeah maybe you can do them uphill i i think that yeah mu- muscularly or still or also peripherally you do get some uh some adaptations that are dependent on the power and not so so you would get the advantage of training uphill but then the downside would be the uh, the differences in biomechanics and uh, and when when you're doing it at at the high speed so so i think maybe closer to the racing season especially it makes the most sense to do it on the flat so so i, I think that maybe a combination could also be be used there depending on yeah. the time of year I think too um, something to touch on there, and, and potentially we'll touch on it later as well. But you know, going uphill, um, just thinking about cadence as well, because it, it can be easy, especially when when you're doing these efforts. If if you're strictly going to a power target, for instance, that the torque can start to get pretty high if if you're you know going uphill but at a really low cadence. So, and maybe that is the actual purpose of of the session. But if it's not, then I think it's something to consider. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right next one uh, is from scott uh, can you do too much easy riding with the popularity of the 80 20 or polarized training can the 80 percent be too easy is it better to ride towards the top end of zone two in a five zone system or does it not necessarily matter well in classic coaching style i'll just uh, start by saying it depends um so there's obviously a massive difference between someone with you know 
a, a threshold or a quote unquote FTP of 200 watts versus 400 watts, right? So top of zone two for the, the 400 watt athlete might be 300 watts. And there's some limitations there around riding at 300 watts all the time. One, it's like over a thousand calories an hour. Two, you're probably going to be going very fast. So there's safety concerns and also fueling um, concerns if you're doing quite a high volume at that. Whereas if, you're, if your threshold's more around 200, well, then maybe the top of zone two is something like, you know, 150 watts, which is quite quite fuelable from an output perspective. And probably you won't be going that fast um, unless you're quite small or extremely aero. So, you know, I, I think those are the considerations there. Um, can it be too easy? Yes, to, to an extent, potentially, like, you know, if, if you're the 400 watt athlete and you're going out and riding at 80 watts, there's probably not very much stimulus happening. Um, you know, so that there's that end of things as well. But on the flip side of that, if you're the 200 watt athlete, pretty much every ride just to be going at a decent speed is, is likely to be, you know, in that mid to, to top of zone two or, you know, to, to actually get right down to zone one can be quite challenging. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. I agree with all of that. I, I think that, I mean, tech, yeah, technically, obviously, it is possible to to go too easy, but I've never seen that happen. I've, I've never seen an athlete where I think that uh, oh, this this athlete is clearly going too easy for it to have an effect. I think uh, for me, generalizing a bit, but the trend is definitely that a lot of athletes want to push too hard on their endurance days and want to push that middle or uh, top end of zone two, which has its place. Um, for example, if it's race specific, when you get closer to your Ironman races, and, uh, if that's what you're training for, then that's, you need to do a lot of training there because that's close to where you will be racing. Um, but yeah, for the large part of training, when you maybe have a bit more of a polarized, uh, period where you want to be hitting your hard sessions hard and, and, uh, yeah, do as best as you can, then, then I think that there's a lot to be said for just going easy and not ne- not necessarily saying a percentage of your ftp or a zone even but yeah I, I think i kind of tend to pull a lot of athletes down towards zone one rather than zone two for when when they're far away from racing at least and and the uh, one exception i think would be when you have an ftp of 200 watts or below so um quite a few age group female athletes would would fall in in that category and then i think it can make sense to uh to, to, to focus more on the zone two rather than zone one because it's so easy to fuel and, and everything as you as you said but a lot of yeah. age groupers that tend to be in the let's say 250 to 350 watt range for ftp i think uh, i my preference tends to be that a lot of the training is more in the zone one rather than zone two in a five zone system yeah and i think when you have a lower output athlete just in terms of, of raw power obviously those uh i guess zones if when we're using zones the the range has become so so much smaller that i think if you get too dogmatic about it 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 can be uh really really challenging in in the real world kind of context to actually nail yeah 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 i think rpe is another one like uh using rpe to to make sure that you i i'm quite happy for an athlete to go out and ride an rpe of three and maybe four but yeah uh three would be kind of an an average i would say some days it might be a two if they're tired but yeah um all right i think we can go on to move on to the next question uh and uh this is let me see who is asking Stu has several questions so let's take one at a time firstly where should i calibrate my power meter the power meter app garmin watch or by computer um personally i i usually just I think there's a difference and I'm not an engineer, so uh, you, you would know more about this than me, Michael, but the difference between a calibration and a zero offset. So they are actually different things, right? Are they? I'm, I'm actually, I actually don't know. <laughs> I've, I've yeah, never okay. understood the difference. I mean, I guess you can do a factory calibration where it's yeah. you know yeah. properly calibrated versus using the Garmin to, to zero offset, which right. is what, yeah. I, what, what I would do. Uh, mm. most of the time and I usually don't do it for every ride but potentially that that's the way to do it and um, you know I always recommend just making sure the drive side cranks at 
six o'clock position. And then, yeah, just it, I mean, it's called calibrate on the Garmin and, and calibrate that way. Um, personally, I haven't used the power meter apps to, to do it. Um, but I've only just moved from mechanical to, to, uh, ETAP access like in the last few weeks. So I might be a bit behind on, on that one. Yeah. I think, uh, you, you should in theory be able to use either one, whatever you prefer, because they, they should do that zero offset, uh, within, uh, within the processing unit of the power meter itself, and then it transmits the correct data. So, so whichever one you prefer, really. But I do the same as uh, as you do, Lucky, with doing it on the on the Garmin by computer um, and with the cranks at six o'clock. Uh, although I hear that that doesn't make too much of a difference, but I still still do it because it is recommended. And uh, yeah, I I think that's that's it. That's the answer. I mean, uh, the only the only other one actually. there is. Um, just with pedal-based power meters, uh, I know early days I had athletes that um, maybe didn't tighten them to the right torque, and then we had some really weird values. But I'm not sure if that's still still an issue. I don't think it's an issue. At least I've been on Faveros for quite a few years, and it's never been an issue with them. But before that, I was with the Garmin Vector Two, and with them, it could certainly be an issue. But yeah, they had yeah, lots of other issues Garmin, as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um yeah um what was i going to say i think i had something else on that but no i think i think that's that's it then the next question is uh long slash easy slash endurance rides and hilly terrain um it's hilly around where i live how should i handle these hills on easy slash endurance rides I've heard answers ranging from ranging from almost advocating getting off and walking, which would decrease my enjoyment, to going somewhere flatter, which would cut down my riding time, to just doing what you have to do. I'll currently try to go as sustainably as I can on anything of moderate duration and sometimes just sprint over the short punchy ones. Looking at the selection of recent rides, I still spend more than 95% in zone. Um, I think I'll start it by saying I'm very realistic in the sense that I think for essentially all of us listening to this podcast, uh, we do this sport because we enjoy it. So if getting off and walking up a hill is, is really going to decrease your enjoyment, I probably wouldn't recommend it. Um, it's also probably going to destroy your cleats. Uh, you know, I think there's an element of, of that kind of terrain that if that's what you've got to work with, then, then kind of work around it a little bit. You know, I, I maybe would say that that, that idea of sprinting the short hills, you know, if it, if it is meant to be kind of a low intensity ride, um, you know, I, I might flag that one from a coaching perspective, but in terms of just getting up them sustainably, I think that's um, more than adequate. Um, you know, there's always an option to, to go the flatter route, but sounds like he's in an area where, you know, there's not that many flat options. And I think that realistically, you know, you should be able to ride over hills if that's what's, what's around you you just have to be smart and it might be a case of you know as you mentioned before just sticking with that rpe up the hills a little bit <clears throat> yeah no i, I 100 agree uh first of all on on that enjoyment aspect that's uh the most important thing and uh yeah i think that in terms of the options that uh Stu lays out here just doing what you have to do that's uh, that's what i would I would say is is what you should do and, and i mean there's a case to be made for a lot of really strong cyclists come out of hilly terrain, uh, right? So, so it's not, and they probably when they when they've grown up cycling, not being too fast about certainly not walking up up those hills. So, so I I think that yeah, being dogmatic about um, just just how hard you ride them always on every ride is not is not really useful uh, and or beneficial. Um, I think for when when the options that you have is all hilly hilly courses around you, I tend to look more at heart rate and RPE than power, uh, because if the hills are fairly short and you go up them moderately, your heart rate can quite easily stay in let's say a, an endurance zone, even if mm. power is more in a tempo tempo kind of zone. And I think that that's absolutely fine. So. Um, I don't know if when Stu is riding that he still spends more than 95% in zone, if that's power or heart rate. If it's power, I, that's, I would say it's exceptionally high, uh, even for a flat ride. Um, if it's heart rate, then it makes a bit more sense, but then it also uh, shows that, well, yeah, you're doing it 100% right. I think that even if it's 
I don't know, shooting from the hip 80% uh, in the heart rate zone, I would be I would be fine with that. And and also as an overall RPE from the session, staying in that kind of uh, three to four range if it's an easy endurance ride, then uh, unless it's a super long one, then, yeah. then that's also another check check mark for you. It's also a really good opportunity to pr- practice some skills, right? So I've seen plenty of uh, kind of more novice athletes who they they might have some speed into a hill and then they start going up the hill, don't want to push too hard, lose all their speed, then have to get out of the saddle and almost sprint to, to kind of even maintain any semblance of speed where if they had have just stayed on the gas a little bit and, you know, kind of, maintained at least a moderate power they could have held a lot more speed kind of up the climb and even over the climb um and again it's another opportunity to practice not only getting to the top of a climb but actually once you're at the top getting back up to speed before you kind of take that recovery so there's plenty of opportunity there to to practice some things that will be really beneficial in racing as well yeah and i think it's to his credit that's maybe what he refers to when he says that he sprints over the short punchy ones just maintaining momentum um yeah and also with with that with the skills aspect um i think that's if you don't have hills around you that's a much uh more problematic situation because you never get to practice things like descending so i would actually rather have only hills than than only flats uh so and that's something that i would in my early days i would i would not like to do hilly rides because then the power would go down when you're going downhill and you would get a lower average power but actually uh now every time uh, i'm riding a hilly course i'm <laughs> i don't care about that at all uh but i i see it as a as a great opportunity to okay on the downhills let's really practice technical skills and practice descending and cornering yeah. and those sorts of things and, and i think that that's that's a really good opportunity so definitely uh also uh yeah hilly terrain should not be a reason to let's say stay in on swift if uh, everything else is set up for you to go out and ride and it's not dangerous with traffic and and the weather is okay so um yeah um yeah next one um my question is from andy who writes my question is a simple one what is the best power zone at which to do a low cadence work when using an indoor trainer or should these be done at varying powers power zones well that's uh quite the can of worms isn't it i i mean i i don't think there's any one best power zone i think it's depending on on what you're trying to achieve um you know especially if we're talking about um on the on the ergo or the indoor trainer um it 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 really is probably an area that i think is starting to get a lot more actual research into it but there's definitely plenty of coaches out there doing very high torque work um it's something that you know when i say very high torque i might be talking like under 40 rpm at at reasonably high power kind of thing um and and there's been coaches doing it for a long time but you know it's it's definitely one of those cases where i think hopefully the research starts to to catch up with what's already been implementing in practice um but for me yeah i don't think there's any one perfect uh power zone to be doing low cadence work no, you see athletes and coaching doing it, I would say, anywhere from zone three. Well, zone three and zone four, I would say, are probably the most common. But then you also see like more shorter, higher torque, higher power zone five work. And, and even in some mm-hmm. cases, longer zone two, um, high zone two kind of things. I would, I would say zone three and zone four are in terms of how normal it is, common it is, that that, that would be the most common ones. But I agree there's... I mean, yeah, we don't really know what is the best power zone. I would say that uh, Sebastian Sitko, who was recently on on the podcast and was quite critical about this because, not saying that it does, doesn't work, but that, well, there is not evidence supporting it at this point. He actually recently, I saw through his Instagram, he wrote a blog post where he basically listed all of the studies that have been done and what they did. So so if anybody's interested, you can go to uh, Sitko Training dot com or es i'll try to put a link uh but then there you can find a list of studies on um on torque training on cycling and uh yeah have a look and see see what has been done in the research if, if that's of interest yeah and just like further to your point i think it um it again comes down to to an output thing as well doesn't it like i mean for someone someone might be able to be at the top of zone two at 320 watts well that's a lot different than 
140 watts in terms of if you're both at 50 rpm so yeah, yeah actual output matters as well yeah all right uh next question uh let me see here it's from um uh, who is this from uh sindra who writes here are a couple of questions about bike training relating to inertia and torque uh one what is the benefit of low cadence and high torque intervals if it has a benefit when and how can it best be used in training so we're continuing on the same topic a little bit yeah i think i think we just touched on that a little bit um i actually read peter leo's study yesterday um looking across i think it was pro continental under 23 and world tour riders around talk you know um and that potentially talk was a differentiator there um as opposed to, to cadence but um again like for me I'm not sure that I can point to all the studies right now. And, and if it was me, I'd be saying to, to go to that blog post that you just mentioned in terms of the, the actual research for that very high torque, reasonably high power kind of work and low cadence. Yes. Yeah, I'll put that in. Make sure to put that in the show notes so people can go and have a, have a look. Um, and, and, and this is probably a, a good example of um, – that neither of us is saying that that doesn't work or we haven't used it before. I just think it's um, an area, especially as, as triathlon coaches, you know, it's, it's starting to get into that realm of, well, we're, we're always considering three sports. So um, to, to implement really high torque intervals into a block is sometimes challenging. And that's not to say we don't or won't do it. It's just, um, yeah, I think we still, still have some work to do on, on educating around the actual purpose behind it. Yeah, yeah, and also I, I think that uh, as as you get, I guess more more knowledge about topics, the more you realize that you how much you don't know. So maybe, um, I mean, the the potential, the pr- proposed and purported reasons for why torque intervals work have been uh, mentioned many times before on the podcast. But I think that yeah, it's since actually we don't really know. Then it, it really doesn't make too much sense to go into the uh, the hypothesis. I mean, I can think of a, a practical example, which which is not necessarily um, delving into the physiology, but um, I know there's a course here in Australia that, that the uh, the ITU or the draft legal juniors do, which has a kind of 60-second hill in it, and, and they do it, I think, four or five times. So, And, and what I see when I've kind of – coached a couple of juniors and done some training with them on something similar is they can easily get stuck in in too big a gear and and when you're already halfway up the hill you have no choice you're out of the saddle you actually can't change gears so they need to be able to generate enough torque to to get up the hill in that race situation so in, in those situations yes we've we've kind of used it but again that's not really going to the physiology as much as it is just the specificity of the actual race course itself yeah, but that's a great point. I, I think that the the more your focus is on a some kind of race with with a big steep hill, or even if it's a one minute hill or a thirty minute hill with so that is slightly less steep, then you have the the more specific this type of training becomes, and and then and 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 that also goes into what kind of intervals and what kind of zones are best. What what is more specific to your race? Is it a one minute hill or a thirty minute hill? That can inform some some of those training decisions. Um, yeah. Part two of the question is: How does inertia influence training indoors and outdoors? Modern trainers can simulate inertia. How can this be actively used in indoors winter training? I've actually never had a trainer that. Uh, I mean, I think we it goes onto a question down here that that kind of simulates going downhill. Um, to be honest, I, I think maybe the tax does that, but but I'm still on the old uh, elite, and now I've got a watt bike, which which uh, I guess it it has it comes down to the flywheel and things like that. And I remember riding the old uh, is it the Le Monde Revolution that sounded like a Boeing seven four seven, and that was um that was always good for that that kind of feeling of of actually I guess road feel, um, you know does it if, how can it be used if actively in indoor winter training i'm not really sure i i understand that question so much i mean i think you're kind of bound by the the you know w- what you have available in terms of the trainer 
Um, yeah, but I think I, in terms I, I have, of its influence, it's inf- sorry, in terms of its influence, like I think I kind of mentioned it before that there, there is an element of, of actually being able to ride fast. And, and in the end, when it comes to triathlon, it's, it's not who can produce the best power or the most, uh, steady power. It's, it's who can actually ride the fastest and, and you do actually have to be able to ride fast. Yeah. No, I, I have the, the text Neo two, and, uh, yeah, I will say that it can, I think it can be used like if you're, especially if you live somewhere where you don't have the option of getting out and riding on the weekend, which, which I always do, but Sinde is in Norway, I know, um, uh, because, uh, he will be at our training camp, uh, next month. Um, so then I, I think it helps to do your, your rides, outside of erg mode and uh and in tax i think you have a setting as well that simulates because the inertia is not it's not the same as as outdoors it's it's a basically a smoothed or uh, yeah a, a smoothened out version of it and you can but you can change that setting so it becomes more or less like riding outdoors and i think mine is probably set to the default which is somewhere in the middle but you could actually set it to to somewhere to to get more closer to the real world feel of riding downhill or if you if if you want to just produce the maximum amount of power the easiest thing would be to set it to where it is not really a big factor at all but actually i that's that's something that i would say that you can use it by not riding in erg mode and having that to at least kind of in the at the middle middle of the range setting or even maybe setting it to to slightly closer to the the real world uh inertia yeah. that you would experience and and swift is good with that because a lot of the courses have a lot of hills so so you are forced to go uphill and downhill and then uh keep your power when you're going going downhill that can be can be a reasonably good practice i'd say in saying that though even outside of erg mode on swift um even on on hilly courses unless the athletes actually essentially freewheeling down the hill um i tend to see files being far more steady power output than than they would be outside oh, yeah. because yeah down the hill you can still push decent power if you want to you can just go into a harder gear you know so yeah. there's an element there too of um you know how how you're treating it yeah no that's and that's where you could experiment with that setting which i haven't done i've mine is set to the default but i, I would be curious to actually from this question find out just how much that would change if you set it to the most extreme and where it supposedly more closely simulates the real world. Um, question or part number three of the question is some people struggle to generate the same power on a slight downhill compared to an incline. Why? What makes a grinder or a spinner? Can this be trained? Uh, we're kind of answering the same questions, I feel. Is there something to add here from your side, Lockie? Um Not particularly, apart from if you want to see someone that can hold power at very high speed the last turn of uh ghana to pull italy through in the uh team shoot at the olympics is one of the greatest things you'll ever see right yeah uh <laughs> let me see do i have something to add on that um i just think that tra- training training in a varied way training outdoors uh when you can training on hilly courses and and just practicing uh, generating power on a slide downhill that that's that's what can yeah I, i'm I've, i'm absolutely 100 percent sure that this can be trained uh, yeah you just have yeah. to try to find opportunities to to do so and and that's generally mostly outdoors even with uh, uh because yeah e- even with with the inertia simulation of some modern trainers uh for some people have a hard time producing the same power on an indoor trainer compared to outdoors why is this individual is this related to the questions about I think it is a bit, but then there's some other factors here as well. So one would be cooling. I think that's massive. Um, so whether that's the actual temperature in the room, but also airflow. So I always recommend getting a very good fan as a start point. And if you're in Australia, probably running some air conditioning as well at the moment because it's very hot. Um, so that, that would be the start point for me. Number two is uh, I think, you know, I've certainly noticed – on my indoor trainer, not now with the watt bike, but my old one, if I ran the front wheel chuck, actually, uh, my, you know, effective saddle angle was like one or two degrees tilted up. Um, so actually it had me basically riding up a small hill all the time. 
And so my hip flexors would get really tight. But if I didn't have it in, then I was riding downhill all the time. So it was kind of a catch, like, which one did you want to choose? Um, so that that could potentially have a little bit of an effect as well. And then third is what I, I think I just mentioned about even Zwift outside of erg mode is what you end up seeing a lot uh, from my end is this really, really steady um, power output. So even Zwift racing, you, you tend to see like, not a huge discrepancy between, say, normalized and average power, not a huge variability index or anything like that. Um, and so when you start doing long, long sessions, I think you just have this very, very constant uh, muscle firing pattern, very constant output and torque, and, and it's just quite quite draining. Yeah, no, that's, those are all really, really good points. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't have any other reasons for it. Yeah, but I think it is the case that, and and that this is something that we do know from uh, the scientific literature as well that on average uh, people produce higher powers out outdoors than than indoors, but there are exceptions. Some people are actually the opposite. So, um, is there anything else? I think. Uh, just some some people just even have things simple things like struggling with their with their trainer not being maybe that good maybe all an older trainer and so on so so that can make things more difficult than a newer higher quality trainer i think if you're if you are going to spend a lot of time on on the turbo then there is something to be said for getting a a pretty good one i would say it does make mm-hmm. things a whole lot more fun and uh and also effective um but yeah other than that i think you you covered all the uh all the points all, all the points there um yeah next question uh, it's from john and john writes what do you think of rollers as a training tool to substitute for or alternate with a turbo trainer they are supposed to be good for improving handling skills one nice advantage is the ability to pop on any bike the cost seems quite reasonable is it worth taking the plunge and how much you best use rollers in training uh, i.e for which workouts any pitfalls to avoid um yeah look i I mean from from a coaching perspective i don't mind rollers i know there's a new roller out from is it wahoo that i think your front wheel is actually uh yeah in so you know it's essentially not really working on those skills so much but maybe it does allow for a little bit of lateral movement um you know I, i guess for me it depends which rollers that you're getting like are they providing resistance number one or you know enough resistance to do uh, proper intervals like Allah if you watch a, a few of Lionel's videos I'm sure he can he's got the rollers that give plenty of resistance um so that from that aspect I think yep that they, they are good and and also from a, a quote unquote skills perspective um I quite quite like it but again from from a skills perspective I do think if you're actually spending quite some time outside potentially it's it's not as necessary um so again it's it's probably person to person yeah no i I think that with with a good set of rollers you you could yeah you could easily do it could substitute for a turbo trainer um but i agree with that like the main the bulk of your bike handling skills will come from outdoor riding i would say Uh, i would say for me just personally i'm thinking about well would i get a set of rollers i i think that my answer is no because it's still riding indoors in in one place, so I still want to have some kind of other entertainment, like watching some old uh, WTCS races or things like that. And then I don't want to be uh, risking falling off my bike when I'm <laughs> when I'm focused on mm-hmm. watching a race while I'm uh, while I'm riding stationary indoors. So yeah, I would rather have the uh, the stability of the trainer uh, when when I'm indoors and then then go out and work on my skills. But uh, yeah, if I, th- I think that obviously in different climates uh, there might be there, there might be an element of you don't have that opportunity to go to go outdoors so much so yeah, i can i can see that i have never ridden roller so i actually can't, can't really speak for how much does it actually improve your skills so um but but if yeah if you get if you get a set that can that can have enough resistance then I don't think that it would be any you you're not giving up anything compared to the the trainer and yeah, um, yeah. The, the next part is do you recommend tires wider than 25 millimeters especially on the rear or are there diminishing returns to doing so 
Um, I think it would be wise to check with the wheel manufacturer that you're using. Um, I know there's some some wheels coming out now that are kind of designed around, say, a 28 mil tire. So that's what they're optimized for from a from an aerodynamic perspective. Um, so again, it, it it's one of those very much it depends um, situations. You, you know, I'm I'm rolling on 28 mil tires now on, on my road bike, and I can certainly attest to the fact that it it feels quite nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think actually our, uh, common, uh, friend Bernardo, who is doing a, from Aero Edge, who's doing a lot of aerodynamic testing. He's, that's one thing that I know is on his list of things to, to test a bit more systematically. So maybe, maybe we can have some news from him in the future, in the near future. Um, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it comes down to what you're trying to achieve, right? Like, is it yeah. an aero thing or is it a comfort thing or? Or, yeah, yeah, I, I get, yeah. I, I just assumed because he still wants to ride twenty five in the front, uh, so then then it might be yeah, getting the aero advantage in the front, but getting the the comfort and rolling resistance in the in the rear. I mean, I think I think in theory it makes a lot of sense to do something like that twenty five millimeter millimeters in the front and twenty eight millimeters in the rear. But um, if 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 it's just a comfort thing, then you can definitely go wider than 25 as you say uh yeah. if you want to focus on aero as well then you would you would maybe have to test ideally to know um but i do think you do see quite a few pros that presumably have been testing that are now doing things like 25 millimeters in the front and 28 in the rear so so i think yeah there is there is some anecdotal evidence for that that might be a, a good way to go about things i would say yeah, and you you know you also might be just limited by what your bike can actually fit. Yeah. So, yeah. like an old Cervelo P3, you're not getting 28 mil tires on the back, for instance. Yeah. What about a disc or a near disc on the rear wheel, provided provided the front wheel is not too deep? Is this a real option for most age groupers now, and when should one avoid it? Um, from where I sit, yes, like disc wheel should pretty much always be a go-to but i will preface that by saying when i was traveling more and racing i usually didn't take a rear disc for a couple of reasons one i didn't want to ride around on it all the time for, for training like before those races and two I, I was a little bit worried about it getting kind of ruined in travel as well um so that was that was you know my reasons then, but I think in terms of purely racing, then I'd always be reaching for the disc wheel now. Yeah, uh, yeah, I one hundred percent agree, and I yeah, I don't I don't think that there are yeah a lot of people have worries about handling and wind. I've I've never coached somebody for whom that has actually been an issue, so I ne- I never seen that happen. I think it's maybe something that's happened more back in the day when wheels were not as ad- advanced as they are now. I think now wheels are so good that uh, that it's not a yeah it's, it's not going to be a huge uh, risk. And, and and if you are nervous or struggling, the front wheel is, as the question points out, probably the more uh, yeah. the, the more important one to to maybe nar- narrow it a little bit. So yeah, yeah I, I mean, say I, for, I for performance, know. bring the disc. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm, I know if I haven't ridden, say, an 80 mil front wheel for for a while, the first ride on it, even in moderate winds, I, I, even I'm feeling a little bit um, like I'm getting blown blown about. So the, the front wheel is probably what I'd be considering if your worry is, is getting blown around. Yeah. Uh, and the final part is, are there any add-on hydration systems for TT bikes that really work well? I have tried a whole bunch and have found none found that none really do the job i always seem to end up back with traditional bottles including one between the bars the only problem is when iron man provides water at aid stations in super soft plastic bottles that don't fit snugly into the cages and thus tend to fly off the bike um to to be honest i haven't tried them all um one that i would be interested in trying is probably that profile design area front end um but in saying that, it's obviously not a cheap option. I think, especially if you have a uh, stem that's you know custom to your bike, then then it, or an integrated front end, it's, it's not an option either. But if you do have that that non-integrated front end with a regular stem, then potentially that that's one to look at. Um, 
I certainly like the the idea of a, a regular bottle between the bars if if that's easier for you to um to kind of get the on course nutrition and hydration and then one behind the saddle. Yeah. No, I like that too. And also I haven't tried a lot of them, but I, I have tried a couple and I, I have kind of found the same thing that um they they have tended to leave something to be desired um i i did i was looking at the same the profile design area at one point but then in the end went for just keeping the between the arms regular bottle um yeah yeah it's it depends so much on what bike you have how does it have some kind of integrated hydration as well maybe in the in in the bladder in the back or um or in the top tube or wherever they have they have them these days so it's, it's hard to say but yeah I've, i think yeah I, I i don't think there's anything wrong with with going with the between the arms other than maybe as he says so yeah sometimes if you don't get the right size bottles at races then that can be a bit of an mm-hmm. an issue yeah uh, then- and i think i think even from an aerodynamic perspective um roll, running a, a regular bottle behind the saddle and between the arms obviously has some cost to drinking. I mean, if, you know, you'd hope that you don't have to sit up on the base bar, but you, you definitely have to kind of get the bottle out to, to drink it, um, which has some penalty. But I think the question you have to ask yourself is, does that outweigh the time lost trying to fill up, you know, a front hydration uh, after an aid station? Um, so that that would probably be the question I'd be asking. Yeah yeah um next question is from graham who writes i'm planning to race a hilly course uh 7.3 distance race at roughly 80 percent of ftp how much over should i be on the ups and under on the downs uh, not sure if metrics are relevant to the question but i'm 68 kgs and my ftp is 210 watts um i would say the metrics are extremely relevant to the question actually um because if we're talking 80% of 210, uh, forgive me on my maths, but I think that's just under 170. 178, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, no, you're right. You're right. Sorry, 168. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which which realistically it is not super high output at 68 kilos. Um, and on a hilly course, if, if it's proper hills, to, to get up hills at kind of – 168 watts and 68 kilos you're going to be likely moving fairly slowly so there's going to be an element there of you just have to get up the hills um and i'd say that that means you know you're probably going to have to push up towards that that 200 watts depending on on what the course looks like um what i'd be saying is really trying to avoid time above 200 where you can you know as as is kind of possible with the course because that's when you're really starting to uh to chew up some carbohydrate and and also you know there's some some other factors there as well yeah um no i I agree with that i don't have anything to add but yeah you will be you 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 should be and you will be at a variable power and close to threshold on the ups maybe there are some depending on the steepness of the hills you might you might have to go above threshold for some of them so hmm. um yeah i don't i don't think there, there's not a number you but but i agree with what you said in general if you can avoid going above threshold then then do that but but you should expect to be uh there and thereabouts um or clo- close to it anyway and, um, and that, that might be a situation too where you know on those hills you're also being quite cognizant of cadence and trying to use your gears as best as possible so you know again if you're having to go up to 200 well preferably you could do that at you know a slightly higher cadence as opposed to you know 40 rpm or something yeah i think this is this is a great example of where a lot of uh training that traditional triathlon training is okay we get to the last six weeks of the race and we do um intervals let's say 20 minute intervals at 80 percent of ftp that is a good sort of average uh race power for a 713 but but in this case i would i would argue and i would recommend that uh what graham should do is 
try to simulate the race course in his mm. uh in where he lives if he can go out and just ride on on hilly courses like that and and just find find what he can do and what he can't do uh, maybe with a brick run after to see how he fares on on a, on a run after and then with fueling as well because then you can start to figure out okay this time i i limited myself to to 200 watts on the uphills and i was fine but when i when i went to 210 220 on some of the hills then i really kind of blew up on the run uh, so so yeah try to not be too specific necessarily about the exact power but just go to going out and riding a course almost more to feel uh i think that that could be really helpful here in training yeah yeah uh, the next one is from Everett, who writes, uh, I'm signed up to do an Olympic triathlon with lots of rolling hills. Should I tweak my training to prepare in any way, such as low cadence training, or is it something just to think about when doing race-specific training closer to race day? Yeah, that's part one of the question, so we can start with that one. Yeah, I think you probably just covered it really well, yeah. to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that that there's an element there of specificity, right? So it's yeah typical of a lot of those um uh, i guess plans where you know you're coming into an olympic try it's like yeah as you said you you two by 20 minutes at like sweet spot or whatever you want to call it um but yeah if it's a course with rolling hills you're probably missing a lot of specificity there um of that that variability and and as i mentioned before the actual skill of of riding hills with while maintaining speed which is which is in itself going to net you a a faster time so i think actually getting out and and doing race specific training on the hills is important yeah um yeah and especially with rolling hills i don't think that in in answer to the question about low cadence training i don't think it's something that i would focus on for that reason anyway if it's rolling hills that might be something more if if there are examples like the one minute really steep hill or or something like yeah more of a mountainous course but not for rolling hills uh, part two of his question is is there a general consensus on what the most cost effective bike investments are uh i think if we're talking in the the realm of triathlon um i'd be saying you know starting with a good ideally sleeved tri suit um that, that's kind of well fitting with as little wrinkles as possible um and probably an aero helmet as well and I guess, you know, my area of expertise is not aerodynamics, um, but, you know, I, I think there's some helmets on the market that are generally reasonably good for most people in that respect, and there's probably some that are very good for some people and not very good for other people. So maybe some investigation there into what might be the, the best option. Yeah. Uh, I f- I actually... I. Before this recording, I went to find an old blog post from Shop for What or from What Shop, then Bigham's What Shop. They, it's from 2016, so uh, it's a little bit dated, maybe, but it's called What's It Worth uh, and What's with TT, um, and and they have basically put together a table with the where they have the wattage savings and the cost of different pieces of equipment and then calculated so that what what is the cost per watt uh, and yeah and there you can see there you have everything everything from uh, uh from uh, shoe covers at 10.7 pounds per watt in number 1 there down to uh ceramic speed uh bottom bracket for 1050 pounds per watt <laughs> Because it costs two hundred ten pounds at and saves you zero point two watts, uh, so and and everything in between. Of course, you have a lot of things that are in the ten to thirty uh, or fifty pound range, but and especially in that ten to twenty is quite uh, quite uh, quite quite a good range. The, you have a good helmet, for example, and a speed suit in their case. But I think a tri suit would be a good one uh there's uh good a uh, good tires that's definitely a big one uh mm-hmm. and either going tubeless or latex inner tubes uh there's the uh watch shop dirty fast chain but i think that you could go for any a, a good chain but uh, a waxed chain uh, that that would get the job done and kind of in the middle there you have wheels and uh, and then we start to get into the more like really 
kind of high cost investments. Uh, so this is all equipment. So bike fit is not in there. But if you if you're not in a good aerodynamic position, uh, then yeah, I would say a bike fit is a is a really good. But it, I mean, obviously, you're not guaranteed to get a good bike fit by just doing a bike fit. So some research there is required that it is a good bike fitter, and and of of course. You can never know. No, nobody has a one hundred percent hit rate in get, in doing a good fit. So, um, but I think I think a bike fit can be one of the best investments uh, as well, especially if you haven't done much of much optimization. And and even now, aero testing. I think I think aero testing is where you can you can gain a uh, gain, gain a lot, and uh, and that's where you can find out maybe okay which of these investments is where you have the most to gain as well in terms of other equipment. Yeah, and I think you touched on some points there, which probably for me relate back to also what what are these investments helping you avoid? So, you know, if it's tubeless, it could be that, okay, it's actually also helping you avoid being stopped on the side of the road changing a tube. So maybe you lose some, some PSI, but it seals up and you're able to continue on your race. So you actually might have just saved yourself five or 10 minutes that you could have wasted on the side of the road changing yeah. a tire um yeah so there, there's some aspects of it like that as well and same with the bike fit you know you, you can have the most aerodynamic position in the world but if you're doing an olympic distance try and you can only hold it for 10k and you spend the next 30k sitting up on the base bar well it's it's not doing you very good yeah i think one thing we can say as well is that um for bikes themselves uh, that's a very ineffective investment if if you have a even a half okay bike then upgrading your bike is going to be one of the most expensive investments for the least gain because between between relatively modern bike frames there's there's very little in terms of performance but that being said uh there is something to be said for i think for well designed integration especially if you're doing especially ironman but also half ironman where you can carry a lot of um hydration and nutrition effectively without uh without giving up what uh yep. with with that so so i think that's where yeah you you could you could look if if you have an old older bike that doesn't have those integration options but but in general upgrading your bike is not an effective investment versus a lot of the others yeah yeah i mean the the, the next thing now is also front ends like i think there's a lot of more affordable semi-integrated kind of uh at least extensions and, and front ends coming out which i think will, will change the marketplace a little bit as well yeah. but um yeah yeah uh, but i i would say like for if somebody hasn't done a lot of optimization maybe even just bought their first tt bike uh for me the the number one investment is getting a bike fit that, yeah. that would be the number yeah. one um, all right. Next question: How do you train different riders for the same long distance uh, race uh, with a one hour climb? And it's a it's a half Ironman, half Ironman distance with a one hour climb. Uh, no, I think they're saying either a one hour hill climb or a half uh, Ironman. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, they have done inside tests. And both have a four watts per kg threshold. And he's, they say literally within seconds of each other in the one-hour hill climb. Uh, and the person asking is 205 centimeters, 93 kg, and 0 0.6 VLA max. And uh, their friend is 188 centimeters, 73 kg, and 0 0.3 VLA max. They both have a similar training history of about 10 years, although the uh, person asking the question tends to be more consistent plus higher volume. Um. So I think we're on a bit of a time schedule. We we might not delve too much into the VLA yeah. max concept. Um, and I think maybe, maybe we... just maybe just a point for the listeners that are not familiar. It kind of implies that the one with the higher VLA max uh, is more glycolytic. Uh, let's say so a bit more. Uh, let's say using their fast twitch fibers a bit more more anaerobic, if you want to call it that. Yeah, and so when when I consider this in the context of a half Ironman bike leg, for instance. So the one that's 20 kilos heavier, I mean, at, at AT or, you know, I think in inside that's MLSS or max, maximum yeah. lactate steady state. 
you know, if they're at four watts a kilo and you're carrying an extra 20 kilos, that's that's 80 watts, which is significant, right? So if you're both doing a half Ironman bike leg and, and one's doing 80 watts higher, potentially for a slower speed because you'd assume if they're also nearly 20 centimetres taller that they're not going to be as aerodynamic, um, then their output is just much higher. So from a pure fueling perspective, it becomes tougher. And then if we take in, even if we just assume VLA max, if they are more, you know, the idea being that they, they would burn more carbohydrate at all intensities, then that makes it even worse again. So one would assume that for the bigger athlete, you know, training for a half Ironman bike leg, perhaps they would actually have to target a slightly lower kind of percentage of their, their threshold than the, the 188 centimeter, 73 kilo athlete. Um, you know, when we're talking about a one hour hill climb, then watts per kilo becomes much more of a significant factor. So, you know, it's, it's not surprising that they're within seconds of each other in a one hour hill climb. Um, I guess the question is, how do you, how do you train differently for the, for the different events? Well, you know, I think for the, the larger athlete, as I mentioned, you know, some, some longer intervals at race pace, but really focusing on dialing in nutrition and seeing, you know, wh- what is you can actually kind of take on and, and realistically what you could actually absorb, um, you know, and, and probably having to be a bit more conservative with how you approach a half Ironman bike leg, whereas perhaps the, the smaller athlete could be a little bit more aggressive in, in that respect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I think the the bigger athlete there with the higher VLA max is exactly what you said. The smaller athlete, I think without knowing anything else, uh, uh, as you say, they can be a bit more aggressive with race pacing, but it's also potentially they are more limited by like their threshold might be kind of approaching a ceiling. So maybe they should do some higher intensity intervals to raise their VO2 max. We, we don't know it because they don't say the VO2 max or so here, but uh, I think that that's something that could possibly be the case. Whereas for the the higher VLA max athlete, then yeah, that's probably not something that I uh, that that would be needed because they they are more their needs are more on the very much aerobic side to um, yeah to just become uh, become more able to to be really aerobic for a long time. But yeah, I, I agree with with all of that. I don't have much yeah. So I, I I guess my my point would be that for the bigger athlete, you know, given they have a similar watts per kilo, one would assume the smaller athlete would likely have a, a better watts per CDA or you know aero essentially. So it might be worthwhile that bigger athlete really putting a focus it, in. It could actually. it could be the op- it could be the opposite. It could be it could be it could be for sure. Be, but be, because of the fact that the bigger athlete has a higher absolute threshold it might be so yeah whatever the yeah, yeah, watts, yeah 300, 370 yeah, 300, yeah. 370 watts versus um 290 watts roughly is the is the thresholds that they have in in absolute power numbers so so the watts per cda i would i would almost think it favors a bit the bigger athlete yeah yeah actually it's a good point um yeah, but uh, yeah, I think we covered the training question there. Um, yeah, I think it's really hard to say without without a bit more information. And, and anyway, we've kind of talked about this before. But um, whether VLA Max is the best way to, um, or whether it's something that you should focus your training around, is hard to say. Um, but yeah, anyway, that, that that would be in theory how how I, how yeah I we, we could have another so, we could have another yeah. podcast on on that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Final, final question before we go on to the kind of rapid fire Instagram question is I would like to know how to get faster on the bike and not get dropped. So this is a bit of a tongue, tongue in cheek question, but maybe we can just turn it into like some top tips for, for age groupers who want to get faster on their bike. Yeah. I mean, I think being able to kind of maximize the time you have available to ride, is probably a, a good start point. You know, in, in terms of not getting dropped, there's actually some, some aspects there about, you know, if you're in a group, being able to understand where the best best parts in that group are to, to kind of get the most draft and, and things like that, not getting stuck on the back and getting yo-yoed off, that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, I think it's important to have some structure to your bike training and, and also be willing to put in the time in into it to actually improve. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think 
like the very idealistic answer I would give is just kind of like I don't know if you follow Colin Moore's uh, weekend AMAs, but I tend to follow them, and he often comes to, uh, comes back with an answer that's basically ride more and 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 eat snacks, and and I think yeah. that that's a pretty good one. Uh, but obviously, in an uh, in a realistic world, riding more is not possible for a lot of people. So then, uh, yeah, I think I think it comes down to a bit. What one aspect I guess would be knowing your strengths and weaknesses, and and then figuring out okay, where do you have room to improve? So, um, and that that can be as simple as a critical power test, a three minute test, and a twenty minute test, uh, and maybe a sprint test. That, that's that's a good. Uh, good one to do and see if you're more strong on the endurance side or or on the short power side and then you, that that can be a good starting point for your for your training where you need to work um yeah. so I, I would add that probably as a point knowing knowing your strengths and weaknesses yeah all right so let's do the questions from instagram and we can do them a bit more rapid fire and uh what is the best way to improve descending is the first one uh, be be able to follow people that are slightly better than you at descending and and see the line they take and and how they do it. That, yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I agree. For age groupers, is it as simple as more hours in the saddle? I think we just touched on that it, in its simplest terms, probably. But there's obviously uh, more aspects to that equation that that are very individual. Yeah, yeah, I think. I think I, I think it's not as simple because most age groupers don't have the time. If you do have the time, then then yeah. yes, that that's very helpful. But for most, it's not that simple. Uh, training on road bike and racing on TT bike? Question uh, mark. I think if you spent enough time on your TT bike, then yes. Like for instance, I could pretty much do ninety nine percent of my riding on a road bike and jump still on the TT bike at least now. Um, but I'm sure that will wane off over the years um if you're someone that hasn't really spent much time on a tt back i'd be training on your tt bike yeah uh i agree tips on maintaining bike power outside and not overdoing it i'm not sure if how these are related uh, i think they're saying that when they ride outside they ride too hard uh oh, okay. that would just be a process of being patient yeah being yeah be be accountable to yourself or to your coach if you have one uh, I would add add to yeah. that. Um, intervals in position versus, yeah, well, I think we did that. Intervals, well, actually, intervals in position versus out of position, pl- pros and cons of, of both. Yeah, again, it comes down to what you're trying to achieve. So I think we touched on, you know, if, if we're really just trying to get some central adaptations, then potentially it's it's less important but you know if we're talking about specificity of of a a flat race where you're going to be in time trial position for a long period of time at reasonably high output then yeah you want to be spending time in that position during training doing that similar kind of output yeah uh uh, I'll, i'll add one one more uh pro for the out of position which is kind of at least farther away from racing Personally, I just like to go out on the road bike and and ride up a hill. Uh, yeah. It's just yeah. very freeing, a liberating feeling, and it's Absolutely. fun. And and things that are fun tend to be you know, or quite quite good for you. Um, well, it, it comes back to the last question of is it about more hours in the saddle? So if that if that's more enjoyable and it gets you yeah. out riding, then absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do aero bike socks make a big difference versus regular cycling socks or no socks? I'd say the answer to that is they do definitely make a difference. Otherwise, the professional cyclists wouldn't wear them. Um, but I would refer people to the chart that you already spoke about earlier. Yeah, do they have? Yeah, they have. Well, they have shoe covers there. They don't have socks actually. I I tested I tested calf guards on the velodrome, and that was versus so barefoot and calf guards versus just barefoot uh so two racing setups and the difference for me at 40k an hour was six watts with the calf guard so six watts faster or six watts saved at the same speed uh with calf guards i've I've heard about six to ten is the range of people that i've spoken to that have tested that setup um i've raced in calf guards and i actually found them a little bit limiting on the swim and run i didn't like wearing them so um i'm not sure if that had any kind of actual difference in terms of racing but i just didn't like the the feel of them uh, especially yeah. running when it was a bit hotter 
yeah i do agree with that on the run uh on the swim i didn't feel any difference but on the run i i do think that when it's hot it's not as comfortable um progressive slash ramp warm-up versus set slash rigid warm-up specifically whilst on the trainer um i assume that means like just sitting steady, at 60 steady power and like, yeah yeah I, I think it's i think it's good to do a, a bit more of a progressive ramp warm-up and then take some recovery uh and then jump into the main set i think this is individual depends on what you feel best with really so yeah um, well, I, I mean, it also depends on what the, the session is, doesn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, if you're going to ride at 50% and then jump straight into six by three minutes max, it's probably. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. do that. But but I, I could see uh, some, some athletes might prefer after an initial easy uh, 10 minutes or so doing a bit of a ramp or just jumping straight to, let's say, five minutes at threshold. That, so for some some people the ramp might work better for some people the steady threshold might work better so um yeah i yeah. think i think to just um to touch on that is to it's it's probably not too surprising even if it's something sub threshold for heart rate to just be a little bit higher from that initial oxygen depth but yeah. that's um that's pretty expected yeah and actually, well, Andy Jones, Professor Andy Jones, uh, did some good research back in the day with warm-up protocols for middle distance running and and they found that was it 30 second like really hard almost race effort for 800 meters which is very hard uh, but uh let's call them just zone five uh efforts that that, that works really well so yeah. so that is something that i tend to do if at this time of year we're at the end of february a lot of athletes do running races i tend to give for a 5k race let's say a 30 minute warm-up 25 to 30 minutes including five minutes at tempo at first and then in the last 10 minutes of warm-up three to four 30 seconds pretty hard like 3k pace uh efforts and uh yeah. and then some easy jogging to finish off and finishing that warm-up ideally 10 minutes before the race starts or so not, not so much more than that yeah um should i fuel on my easy recovery rides uh again it depends uh I mean, if it's like an hour and it's very easy, low output, then it's probably not necessary. Um, if it's, you know, you've already done a long track session in the morning running and, and a swim and then you're, you're doing your third session of the day, so you're already really glycogen depleted, then maybe. I think there's a there's a spectrum there of it depends. Yeah, exactly. And, and what you have coming up next as well so yeah. yeah because i mean um, if if, you're, if it's say 90 minutes and there's traffic lights and all of a sudden it's two hours well if you take nothing it's just two hours that you're not eating so you know like would you do that if you weren't out for a recovery ride i guess that's also a question to ask yeah do we need so many names for minor differences along the lt1 to lt2 continuum tempo sweet spot etc um Working more in the in the realm of triathlon at the moment, um, I probably use that range more along the lines of, say, Olympic distance effort or 70.3 effort kind of thing. So I, I don't necessarily use those names so much. Um, and again, I think that range of, of output is probably where you start to delve a bit more into specificity of the race as well. So a lot of racing is in that range. Um, probably in, in triathlon, the only one is, is Ironman where you start to, to kind of get below that, that LT1. So I tend to use from a coaching perspective, more uh, specific to, to the race. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree with that. I, I also do that quite a bit, although, I mean, I do also, to be fair, use tempo sweet spot, but I, I think, no, we probably don't need so many. Uh, I think it comes down to in that range at the higher end of the range, you will do the power is higher, but the duration will be a bit lower. The duration of the intervals and maybe the duration, the, well, definitely the overall duration of the workout. And at the lower end of the range, the power will be lower, but the duration will be higher. So, so you don't the workout. It it takes care of itself when you think about the workout design. Really, are you doing four by ten minutes at the higher end of the range, or are you doing um, four by thirty minutes at the low end of the range? That's yeah. Uh, yeah. It yeah, it takes care of itself. How to do a proper bike fit by yourself? Hmm. 
It's a, it's a good question. I mean, I know there's a lot of apps out there at the moment which can uh, take like knee angle, hip angle, all of that stuff. Um, the only caveat to that for me would be that, you know, like everything, those angles, you know, it's it's a bell curve, right? So, you know, you might be lucky one that fits right into the middle and, and then the recommendations are, are spot on, but but you could also be someone that's at, at either end and, and so – to an extent, you do have to experiment a little bit with what's best for you. Yeah, do you know, I know one of those apps, but I I guess I don't know it because I don't remember the name of it. Do you have any? Uh, I'll pull one up. On, I think I've got one on my phone here. I'll have a quick look. Hopefully this is not too bad, too bad a radio. Um, While you look that up, I can say that one other resource that I would probably recommend, not that I have actually read it myself, but Phil Burt, who... Is a very well respected bike fitter, and I've interviewed a couple of times on the podcast. He has a book that is uh, basically about how to do a bike fit yourself. I would say so. I'll try to find it and put the link to that in the show notes as well. I actually one of my athletes did read it, and she was tinkering a lot with her bike fit, and uh, uh, because she had some some issues with it. So I, I think, yeah, if you want to do a bike fit yourself, then that's probably a resource that that could be worth looking into alongside maybe using one of these apps and uh, the output that the app might give as a as a starting point and then then maybe the the knowledge that you might gain from a from a book like like Phil Burt's could help you further optimize it so the app i have is called uh bike fast fit and i i mean i only used to use it really just for changing saddles so like i've historically not been one to love many saddles so I'd, I'd play around a lot with saddles but i would just use it to make sure that i was maintaining the same kind of knee angle and hip angle between different saddles yeah um yeah i i but i yeah i would say that if you if you want to go down the the route of doing a bike fit by yourself then expect to put in um a lot of time and tinkering unless you are somebody who is uh what phil Burt would call a macro absorber that can do just about anything but uh but yeah it's a trade-off you're maybe saving some money but you're investing a lot of time instead in tinkering and but that's but again it's not to say that you will go and get a bike fit and you will be perfect from the start so so it certainly can be a good thing to 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 learn to do these things and adjust things when as you say for example you do a change of equipment and and uh, that, that could be yeah, it could be an investment worth making in in your knowledge. Uh, yeah. Next question. Yeah, I, I don't quite understand this. How to know the be- how to know the better point between LT one and LT two to seventy one three race pace? I guess where seventy one three race pace should be. Maybe is that what they mean? Yeah, that's that's how I read it. I think um, <laughs> I've said it a few times today, but it really depends. Like output is one thing. Uh, race dynamics becomes really important, right? So, I mean, I, I can. Yeah, tell you from experience in say the professional male race, like you know, within that range, back and forth a lot during during the race. Sometimes you ride close to LT two for long periods, or um, then, then you know you might be in the group down at even you know LT one or below. So that there can be a huge range, um, you know. But again, if if you're a lower output athlete, that range is is likely to be quite small. So you know, finding an exact point between there might be quite challenging because actually the course dictates that you know you, that whole range is basically your race pace so yeah it, it really depends yeah um yeah i would echo that and also the points that we made earlier about the course being important so trying to simulate the race course and uh and and then if it's let's say it is a very flat course and and you don't care about race dynamics you you're just trying to do your best time trial and you can do it because it's a completely flat course then uh still simulating the race in training a bit so doing something like i've i've, I've said all the way up to six by 20 minutes with five minute recoveries at let's say race pace and 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 if an athlete can do that in a pretty heavy training week then even if the race time is going to be more like two and a half even up to three hours i i think that that what you can do in a workout like that is quite indicative of what you probably can can do on race day um yeah, so yeah. so yeah 
Yeah, um, the only thing I'd add to that is that, you know, during that workout, you're kind of doing race fueling and hydration yeah. and things. So yeah. Yeah, otherwise, it probably won't feel so easy. Yeah. But then there are also other considerations even like, are you doing that workout on the trainer or outdoors, of course, as we have talked about, but also whether are you doing it in uh, a cooler climate and then you're going to race in a, in a hot race that, that will have an impact for sure. Uh, final question, LT1, 170 watts, LT2, 220 watts, FTP, 240 watts, 60 kg triathlete. What to focus on for 73 races? Um, oh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I mean, I guess they're kind of asking should they work on pushing their lt2 up or their lt1 up is that is that how i'm reading it? i i read it like that yeah yeah can can we see any strengths and weaknesses with there i mean i think yeah we, we could argue on semantics about ftp versus lt2 being 20 watts apart um because again we, we just don't know we don't know how FTP has been measured, nor do we know how LT2 has been measured or LT1. So that that in itself throws a bit of a spanner in the works. Um, look, I, I'd be saying that, you know, those outputs are already reasonably good for a 60 kilo triathlete, like a threshold around four watts a kilo, um, you know, but again, we, we don't have previous uh, 70.3. So if, if something here had been that, they can't even hold 170 watts for a 70.3. Well, then maybe we'd need to work on that kind of, you know, ability to hold, you know, constant power for a, for a long period of time. Um, so I think there's too many unanswered questions to really dial in there. Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think so. I think so. The, the the thing that everybody needs to focus on when doing a race is race specificity at, at some point. Um, so... And we have discussed that in in the many ways that you do that, but race simulations and so on, nutrition. Yeah, I think that's how you can dial in what you can do. But then for, in terms of optimizing this athlete's ability to perform better in future races, yeah, knowing knowing how long, what they have done in past 713s, if they have done them or what they will do in this first one, if it's the first that that will help also i would like to, i would like to see a critical power test there like a three minute test and a 20 minute test see the discrepancy between the three minute and 20 minute power that sort of thing yeah what, what i would note is that just purely looking at that data um saying that they had a bit of experience and could race say somewhere close to 200 watts at 60 kilos um on a relatively flat course there's no reason that that can't still be quite a decent speed you know, yeah. like I think 200 watts at 60 kilos, you know, if you can get a good aero position, that should still net a reasonably fast speed on a, on a flattish course. Sure. Yes. I, but this, <laughs> and, and this is my, this is an additional point on that or building on from that. I would focus on aerodynamics because especially if it's a flat or rolling course, then what's per CDA will probably be more important than what's per kilo. And this is yeah. where smaller athletes have a disadvantage uh, over bigger athletes, because even if your watts per kg is the same, then generally your watts per CDA will be uh, will be lower. So, but so so that's something to really focus on. Then uh, I I would say to really maximize your or minimize your CDA, and uh, yeah, focusing on aerodynamics, making sure that you can hold race position. Uh, when drinking when hydrating and all of those things try, trying to minimize that time spent outside of an optimal aero position all, all of those things all the things that you can do to to be as aero as you can for the duration of the race i think that will that, that could make a big difference for um for any athlete but but especially for a smaller athlete who is at a bit of a disadvantage yeah yeah all right um yeah that's all the questions that we had uh yeah that's that was great thank you Lucky. No, thank you. Hope to do it again another time. Sounds good. I hope that you enjoyed that Q&A. The one on run training will be coming up in April, but we will probably be recording that within a couple of weeks of you hearing this interview. So here is an open request for you to, as soon as possible, really submit your questions if you have questions on the topic of run training in a triathlon context, uh, and we'll try to answer all of them. Actually, even run training in general, because of course we do have uh, single sports athletes listening to the podcast, so so I would welcome uh, just running training 
training questions as well if uh, if anybody has them uh, also uh, just uh, to note that on the scientific triathlon instagram and newsletter we do send out these requests as well so feel free to follow there uh, if you want to get informed every time uh, i put out these requests for questions you can find the show notes uh, for this episode on scientific triathlon.com with links to resources mentioned and past q a's uh, some things that i put in for links were in particular were the torque training article by professor sebastian Chitko and uh, the article by dan bigham that i referenced about the pounds to what ratio of certain bike upgrades also the book by phil burt is called the bike fit second edition optimize your bike position for high performance and injury avoidance and uh, the app that Lockie mentioned was bike fast fit uh, also one that i was thinking about but forgot the name of was my velo fit which i have uh, been uh, as subjected to once so i have a very minimal experience with it uh, but yeah that's another app to consider for apps for bike fitting next monday i interview jim vance who is the longtime coach of ben canute who is an olympian and twice second place at 7.3 worlds and uh, to finish off just a reminder that if you have goals in triathlon that you are working towards achieving then consider working with one of our coaches or one of our training plans we have options for athletes of all different levels and with or no matter the size of your goals a few points to highlight that reduce the barrier to get started is that we have no minimum commitment term for coaching nor any startup fees and for training plans we have a 100 satisfaction guarantee for plans purchased on our website and we have an exchange guarantee so you can exchange your plan Plan for another plan if you purchase through training peaks uh, we also have consultation and customized plan options so you can check out all of that and uh, contact us through scientific triathlon.com and we can discuss your specific goals and needs and see what is best for you finally big thanks to our sponsors form that you can find on forumswim.com forward slash tts improve your swim training with real-time metrics like pace stroke rate and heart rate and advanced post swim analysis use the code tts15 to get 15 percent off the form smart swim goggles and thank you to zenate use the zenate swim trainer to improve your technique power stamina and swim training consistency you can try the zenate risk-free for up to 30 days and get a special tts bundle that includes the zenate swim trainer and a number of zenate training plans and on-demand workouts on zenate swim trainer.com forward slash tts thank you as always for listening keep training smart and keep loving triathlon <laughs>